Welcome to the European Central Bank podcast, bringing you insights into the world of economics and central banking. My name is Michael Steen, and in this first episode, we'll be taking a look at innovation and payments, cryptocurrencies, blockchain, and the latest plans to create a global digital currency with Facebook's Libra. There's certainly a lot of interest around innovation and payments, and so-called cryptocurrencies in particular have captured the imagination of many. The best known one, Bitcoin, has been a trending topic over the last few years. And the same can be said for blockchain, which is the technology underlying most cryptocurrencies, which has many potential uses from securing business transactions to voting systems and even music streaming systems. Now, more recently, media headlines have featured Facebook's plans to create its own global digital currency and the accompanying financial infrastructure known as Libra. So what is happening in digital payments and currencies and what is the role that the central bank plays? My first guest today is ECB Executive Board Member Benoit Curé. He's been working closely on these topics as the chair of the G7 Working Group on Stable Coins. Benoit, hi. Let's start by taking a step back, um, thinking about what we're talking about. We're talking about digital money, but what actually is money itself? The way an economist would answer your question is uh, pointing out that money has three functions. A function as a unit of account. That is, you buy, you order a beer, and the beer typically would be uh, like uh, three euros, uh, and that's a unit of account. Right? But it's also a means of payment. That is, you've, you're actually going to pay for the beer, handing out the, the three euros, and uh, it's also a store of value. That is, you will uh, keep euros in case you want to beer tomorrow. Three functions. And these three functions don't have to go all together. And they can be performed by uh, public money as well as private money. Or any, anything can be used uh, for that purpose, actually. So kids would use uh, marbles or football cards uh, as unit of account uh, and even as store of value. And that's fine. Now, the point is, if you want to use it across a society, widespread use of money and widespread trust in money, mutual trust in money in a group, uh, requires some uh, political agreement, political understanding, which is why now money is a public undertaking uh, and is supported by laws, constitutions, and is managed by central banks. So local use of money can be private. Public use of money across a society, across an economy, uh, nowadays is uh, public, underpinned by laws, and uh, managed by uh, independent institutions called central banks. And so that's to make sure that we all agree on what is this, that this is money. Exactly. And because, uh, and because you want to use, you want to be, to trust money uh, that will be given to you by people you don't know. That's the point. Mm -hmm. uh, anything is possible within a small group. Mm -hmm. But uh, when it's people you don't know, then you need the rule of law to uh, underpin confidence, trust in the, in the currency. Um, and that's why we have monetary law. That's why the uh, role and mandate of the European Central Bank, for instance, is enshrined in a uh, treaty which has been voted by the European people. Now, that, that already gets into this field of the money we have today right now, some of it, the, the money in my bank account, that, which is a, at the end of the day maybe just a number, I isn't physical, is, is already virtual. So now we, we, we shift into this digital money area. What's, what's changing there? What, what is new there? What, why would you need to have... Um, if we already have money that's effectively virtual, why, why is there that all this talk about cryptocurrencies and digital money? So what's new with the, is the technology? And you mentioned the blockchain, which is the underlying technology for many of these uh, uh, cryptocurrencies. So I would say that the main driver of, for, the, for the use of cryptocurrencies has been convenience. That is uh, cost and speed. That is many cases, and in particular for cross-border payments, that is payments from one, from one country to another, uh, they've proven cheaper and faster than uh, existing means of payments based on existing currencies. And that's uh, something which is good, which is useful, and that should be kept, used, uh, and uh, protected. Now, uh, another driver of uh, cryptocurrencies has been financial inclusion. When you're posted in a foreign country, you want to send the money back home to your, to your family. That's called a remittance. And uh, existing systems to transfer money have proven very expensive for these uh, communities. So potentially, these new technologies can also help support financial inclusion. So there's th those two aspects. But the, the, on the first one, making it cheaper and so on, that's, 
that's because you're taking lots of players out of it, that because there's no, n not a chain of banks in, in between the two transactions. It's, it's partly so, ex partly so, because it's more direct, it's disintermediated, uh, but it's also because the technology is, is, uh, is better and, uh, and, and less costly. So there, there seem to be huge opportunities, there's a bit of scepticism as well, and there's some risks. And um, just before we go on, I think we have a quick clip we can play of uh, ECB President Mario Draghi, who uh, summed up some of these concerns at a press conference earlier in the summer. And these concerns, if I can list for them for you, are concerns about cybersecurity, uh, AML, money laundering, terrorism financing, use of uh, these currencies for criminal purposes. All this is linked also to the anonymity, how, how, would, this, uh, how would this work? At the same time, concerns about privacy. I mentioned cyber risk, tax evasion, monetary policy transmission, financial stability, and the global payment system. How would this change the global payment system? So all these concerns are substantial. They need to be addressed before the, before the regulators can, have a, 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 can, have, can look at this with, with genuine interest and positive interest. So Benoit, um, we, we heard there from, from uh, President Draghi on some of the risks. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the, the role that you see for central banks uh, and global regulators in tackling these concerns? And of course, you, particularly your work that you've been doing at the G7. Well, that was well summarized by President Draghi. Uh, on the one hand, uh, we don't want to stifle innovation. So we want to look at what's good, what's useful, what's new, uh, what's uh, cheaper, what's faster in these new technologies. Uh, uh, so that they can benefit the public at large. Uh, and that's something we, we're very positive about. On the other hand, we want to make sure that these new means of payments are safe, meaning they should be safe for their users, in, terms, in particular in terms of uh, preserving the value of uh, any uh, money that's invested in these new means of payments. So uh, we want to, be, to make sure that stable coins are stable. And it really depends on on the nitty-gritty of how exactly the, the currency uh, is, is uh, or the coin is, is backed by uh, assets or by currency, and we're looking into it. So we want to make sure that they are really stable, first thing. And second, uh, we want to make sure that they are safe for a society and they are safe for the economy, meaning we want to make sure that they are not used for criminal purposes, that the uh, money laundering and uh, financing uh, terrorism dimension of it, uh, it is extremely important because we know from experience that uh, new technologies are being used by, by, by criminals and are being used by terrorists. So that's really a key priority for finance ministers and, 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 uh, and regulators across the world. And we also want to make sure that they are not going to um, create financial instability and we want to make sure that they are not going to uh, harm monetary sovereignty. Is that also then a, a concern in terms of who's behind it. So is that, I mean, this private-public kind of debate, I mean, in, if you take the Facebook example, that's obviously a, a private company with, with backed by other private companies. Um, is there a reason that this should either fundamentally be a public sector or a private sector, or is there a...? In principle, no, I would say. Uh, if it's properly regulated, uh, there are many examples of uh, public uh, goods that are provided by private companies, and it's fine. But you need good regulation and you need a lot of control uh, by the government. So that might end up being provided by private companies, but under a very tight public control. Or the conclusions might be that the uh, hurdles are so high that uh, we don't want uh, the currencies to be, um, uh, to be run by private companies. And I don't know. That entirely depends on the answers that would be provided to our questions. And then the regulation is important that, that it's international because, of course, you don't want there to be some jurisdictions where there's a much lower level of regulation and that, that then they end up going there. Absolutely, uh, because uh, we're talking of, uh, of technologies which spread across borders. Uh, we're talking of, uh, in, in, in many cases, of technologies being provided by companies which are already global, with, with a global basis of customers. And we are talking of technologies where the, the main business case uh, is about cross-border payments. So it's by, by essence uh, a, a global issue, and we need consistency in the way uh, these will be envisaged, approached and, and regulated, which is why the G7 and now also the Financial Stability Board in Basel are looking into it.
the governor of the uh, Bank of England, Mark Carney, was at this year's uh, Jackson Hole uh, Economic Symposium. Um, and he gave a speech where he, he made what sounded like a radical proposal. And he was talking about a global digital currency that's actually issued by a network of central banks, um, like the Bank of England and the ECB. He talked about this so-called synthetic hegemonic currency, which sounds very impressive. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Now, the answers, the, the responses to cryptocurrencies and to stablecoins are not necessarily about issuing our own digital currencies. We might end up doing it, but another response on our side is about improving the existing payment systems so that the needs that are evidenced by the whole discussion in the first place, that is the demand for cheaper payments, the demand for faster payments, can be met by traditional payment systems. So uh, the whole discussion is a useful wake-up call uh, for the central banking community and it makes us understand that we've got to be faster and, and, uh, and, and we've got to step up uh, upgrading of our payment systems. So the ECB has been doing it. Uh, we have a, a fast payment system, uh, TIPS, a 24-7 payment system, which works very well. There might be other initiatives that we could take to uh, make it more accessible, in particular uh, for cross-border payments. So the, the main gap I would see, or the, the next frontier in terms of central banking activities, would be to find efficient ways to connect our fast payment systems uh, so that they, are, uh, they can be used by citizens to uh, transfer remittances, to uh, send money uh, back home, to, to send money across borders, so that uh, cryptocurrencies will be less needed in the first place. Benoit, thank you very much and good luck with the work at the G7. Thank you for your interest. So having looked at the bigger picture surrounding these new payment innovations, we'd now like to go into a little bit more detail with our next guest, Maria Teresa Chimenti, ECB market infrastructure expert. She's one of the ECB's leading experts on cryptocurrency and has recently co-authored research on what we call the crypto asset phenomenon. Um, Maria Teresa, Bitcoin is actually one of the most searched for terms on our website. There's, there's clearly a lot of hype about it. Um, but we at the ECB actually refer to Bitcoin as a crypto asset rather than a cryptocurrency. Can you tell us why? Indeed, we think that terms like cryptocurrency are a misnomer. Instead, the ECB refers to Bitcoin and the likes as crypto asset. In the euro area, crypto assets are neither legally established as currencies, euro being the single currency of the euro area, nor are they legal tender. Also, currency are issued by trusted authorities with a mandate to preserve the currency stability. There is no such a framework in place for crypto assets. They've, got this, they've also got this huge volatility, don't they, including the, that's one of the problems with Bitcoin. But I think there's another difference, which is also the, what's backing um, the currency, right? Yeah, in, in our May 2019 report, we have pinned down the crypto asset phenomenon to the absence of an underlying claim or liability against an issuer. In other words, the value of crypto assets isn't backed by anything or by anyone. Unsurprisingly, the valuation of crypto assets is very difficult and may be also subject to speculation. Therefore, the users of crypto assets are up against potentially very large losses in adverse market conditions. Also, if a crypto exchange or a custodian wallet provider is hacked or goes belly up, the customer's holdings will not be protected by the equivalent arrangements of a deposit guarantee scheme. As a matter of fact, the European supervisory authorities have issued many warnings um, to the users of crypto assets and the risks of buying crypto assets have been also touched upon by the um, authorities. So that enter then at this point Facebook with their Libra um, initiative. Now that's based on this thing that we touched on briefly with Benoit but you can tell us a bit more about this notion of a stable coin. That's meant to address one of these weaknesses if I understand correctly, yes? Yeah, so starting for, from, from Libra, Facebook's Libra is a whole new ball game. Libra would be a stable coin backed by a reserve of assets and a payments infrastructure. Like crypto assets led by Bitcoin, Libra also has an ambition to serve as a borderless currency, but this is where the similarities end with crypto asset and the differences begin. 
Unlike crypto assets, Libra will have a clearly identifiable issuer and a governing body, the Libra Association. The Libra Association is committed to managing the reserve assets as to preserve Libra's value over time, and by doing so, minimize price volatility relative to major currencies. Libra is also very different from current stablecoin um, initiatives and arrangements. Stablecoin are hardly used outside the crypto asset market. Libra, on the other hand, could go mainstream very quickly for starters. The resulting size or potential size of the Libra's network is large enough to trigger sweeping network effects on a worldwide scale. Of course, so Facebook obviously has its huge scale here. Uh, and it's an example of a stablecoin, but if, it, but also it's not the only kind of stablecoin, right? A stablecoin is not always backed by assets. Is that correct? Indeed, stablecoin is a phenomenon under development. Currently, there is no common view or agreed definition of what is a stablecoin. We define stablecoin as digital units of value that are not a form of any specific currencies or basket of currencies and rely on a set of stabilization tools to minimize fluctuations in their price relative to a currency. Stablecoins can also be further um, distinguished on the basis of what underpins their value. Stablecoins can be backed by funds. Stablecoins can be backed by traditional asset classes, such as government bonds or by commodities. Stablecoins can also be backed by crypto assets or they can be based exclusively on the perception, on the expectations by users that their holdings will maintain a stable value. Is there more work that we're doing on this, given that it's such a new and sounds like a changing phenomenon? Um, we um, are the first central bank to publish research on stablecoin covering the taxonomy and the use cases. This work obviously lays the foundation for more work especially when it comes to the analysis of the potential implication of stable coins for the payment system, as well as for the euro system mandate and tasks. We obviously don't have all of the answers. In fact, uh, stable coin also have a cross-border dimension to them, which requires that we collaborate with other authorities around the world. And this is why the ECB works with their peers in international fora, to address the most pressing questions and issues raised by stablecoins. Now, a key aspect that we haven't covered in depth yet is the technology that makes these things possible. Bitcoin, Libra and other new projects have one thing in common. They're based on a technological innovation known as blockchain. We at the ECB have been studying this new technology quite carefully, uh, particularly in what we call our innovation lab. And our next guest, Dirk Bullmann, leads a team at the ECB that looks into innovations in payments. So, Dirk, welcome. Can you tell us a bit about what blockchain actually is? Blockchain is an infrastructure. So it's, it's a road, so to speak. And crypto assets and uh, stable coins, they are the cars that use these roads. So if you want to move a crypto car from person A to person B, you use blockchain as a road. So. So this would be an explanation I would offer, but then you, you might ask, okay, uh, good, blockchain is a road, but what is special about the blockchain road? Um, if you want to transfer money today from A to B, you can do that. You can pay in a shop, buy online, make an electronic transfer to a friend. This works without problems. The roads are there. But, but what, um, what makes blockchain interesting, I would even say fascinating, to, uh, to many people is the underlying idea of having a much simpler road network. In today's world, if, if I want to transfer money to you, you know, it, it goes via my bank, maybe an intermediary bank, it goes via a payment system to your bank before you eventually uh, get, the, get the money. So in particular, if it's a cross-border transfer, if you assume you, you transfer, I don't know, from here to the States or to, to, uh, to, to Asia in particular, you have many correspondence in between. It's a, it's, a, it's a very complex arrangement. So and the blockchain has the, this vision. The blockchain has the vision of, uh, of working without intermediaries. That means you, you, you don't need uh, to go uh, via intermediary A, B and C. So the road is direct. But yes. Okay, so today if I transfer some money to you and we don't know each other, we both know that's going to work because we trust our banks and we know we're going through the banking system. Potentially in the future, with, with using blockchain technology in this example, 
the idea is that the, the technology itself has that trust embedded so we know that, that it's going to work even if we've never met each other. That, that's the vision that drives the blockchain idea. Yeah. Okay, now we touched a bit on regulation already with, with, with Benoit Curry. Mm -hmm. What are the things, though, are holding back this, this, this change at the moment? What are, what are the blocks at the moment to the blockchain, if you will? From the central bank perspective, we, we see that blockchain, it's a relatively new technology still. Let's, let's, uh, let's face this. It's in its infancy. It's, I mean, there are still teething troubles. I, I think I, I know a bit about this because we have at the innovation, uh, we have at the ECB this innovation lab where we experiment with the technology. Uh, we here do analysis within the family of European Central uh, Banks, within the community, where we internally analyze and experiment with this technology. We also work together with Bank of Japan. We have established a project, Stella. And in, in, in this framework, we do experiments. And uh, so we ask ourselves the questions whether uh, blockchain could meet efficiency and safety requirements of existing payment systems, whether it's cheaper, whether it's faster, whether it can process uh, more transactions uh, than our current infrastructures. And uh, from today's perspective, the answer is no, it cannot. And why not? Just because it's still too new, it needs to develop more, it needs to be more efficient? What's the... Because you would not uh, use a new technology if it just if it could do th just uh, the same job uh, uh, that uh, that is currently done with with the existing and uh, with maybe more traditional um, technologies, so from this perspective, we we don't we don't see that um, blockchain can do something better. But what we see is that there's a there's a lot happening. That uh, the progress in the blockchain space is really huge. So um, and if this continues, I think it would just be a question of time and uh, that blockchain maybe then one day, but here I'm, I mean, crystal ball gazing is not my... Of um, course, of course. But, but, but if, I, if I, you know, as a, as a reader of, of newspapers and so on, you know, I, I, you see everything, people saying Bitcoin is terrible for the environment because it uses loads of energy. You're driving a bit at the, the idea that fine, but these kind of technologies can advance and at some point... Um, it will be quicker and cheaper, maybe than 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 legacy technology. They do, they do. It's uh, the the moment you 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 you, you spot a, a problem, you can be assured that someone out there is already on it. You mentioned, it, and this is this is an interesting thing with with the energy consumption. I said we we we, uh, we have this innovation lab at uh, at the ECB, and we recently got a got a call. Someone external, uh, I think it was a journalist, wanted to know. Um, okay, how how high is the energy consumption in our innovation lab? Because they are they're concerned about the use of of, uh, of blockchain and so on. But uh, yes, the Bitcoin blockchain is is really energy consuming because it uh, it uses a specific mechanism of finding finding consensus within the network on on uh, on the on, on the on the information that is that is there put on the. On the blockchain, so this makes it energy consuming. But we see that um, there are other diff other uh, ways of of finding consensus, and uh, there are a plethora of, of possibilities, and they are far less energy consuming. But people are mainly looking still, surprisingly, I must say, at the at the Bitcoin blockchains. Also, it is, it is slow. It cannot really; it's not really uh, scalable. But yet, yes, maybe this is this this applies to the first generation Bitcoin blockchain. But uh, if you look at um, other blockchain or distributed ledger protocols, as we prefer to call them, out there, you see that um, they are scalable, and they are efficient, and they are far less energy consuming compared to the Bitcoin blockchain. So these problems are in the process of being fixed. Okay. Okay. So it's a crucial thing for the central bank also to 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 know about, but it sounds like it's not ready for for deployment at the moment. Certainly from from our point of view, uh, for us, no, it's not ready for prime time. We have to think twice before we move to a new technology, and uh, we can we can easily implement this in a in a in in in, in a small environment. Uh, but if if we do it in a 
in, in an application which is really uh, crucial for the for the functioning of the financial uh, sector and uh, risks difficulties problems uh, could could uh, really um, trigger financial stability problems then we we need to make sure that this won't happen and this is why we need to carefully look at these technologies and then in the in the in the wider innovation and payments uh, area there is already something we're offering now right this instant payments service the tips uh, that we have which actually is using classical um, if you will technology it's not blockchain but it is very fast and can provide people with 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 the ability to transfer money instantly T tell me a little bit about that if you could yes so uh, tips went live in november 2018 so it's uh, I mean, we, we always develop our systems according to technological innovation and user needs and you see the there's a clear user need towards instant if you if you want to exchange information if you want to uh, download music, if you if you want to stream a movie, everything has to happen in the blink of an eye. You want it, you get it. But but of course, also the payment infrastructure has to be fit for purpose. Then, and we have to make sure that we offer then also a service that could offer this. And uh, in this context, we um, we uh, developed and implemented our our tips service, the target instant payment settlement. Uh, service yes we can uh, process transactions in a fraction of a second we can uh, also process very it's, it's cheap for each transaction costs only a fraction of a of a euro cent so it's it's very it's very efficient and it's it's very cheap and it doesn't it doesn't rely on blockchain uh, technology uh, so as a bank customer though if i want to use that that's what is dependent on my bank using it so i should write to my bank and ask them are you using tips Yes, sure. that's okay. correct. That's okay. correct. Excellent. Okay, thank you, Dirk. That brings us pretty much to the end of this episode. It's clear that crypto assets and innovations in payments uh, are, are a rapidly developing field, and we at the ECB are clearly closely involved. Um, we'll probably come back to this topic for another podcast later on. But for now, I'd like to thank Dirk Bullman, Maria Teresa Chimenti, and Benoit Curé for guiding us through this fascinating world of crypto assets and innovations. Do also look in the show notes for links to relevant papers and publications from the ECB on these topics. You've been listening to the European Central Bank podcast with Michael Steen. If you like what you've heard, please do subscribe wherever you got this podcast from and leave us a review. Until next time, thanks for listening.